Hello, Gary. Hi, Guy. I believe you went to see Elton last night. Yeah, I did. You know, I saw Elton John at the O2. Um, his show is designed by Patrick Woodruff, who designs our of shows. Of course it is. And designed it's like, it's all the big shows. All the big shows. Rolling Stones and Genesis and um, Source Full of Secrets, of course. He was incredible. Elton's voice... I don't, you know, I've heard these rumours that he can't sing like he used to. Well, he's 76, right? But yeah. he, he, to me... But luckily it was always low. Luckily it was always, like, he was always a sort of tenor, baritone, wasn't he? I, so. I think he's singing better than ever. I absolutely loved it. And, I mean, just his playing, his chops. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to play on stage with him. So uh, in the 80s, I played in Dublin two nights, uh, and then I play, played uh, at Wembley two nights. I did Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. Which for a kid who grew up buying those albums, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty sad. But what you realise when you see Elton is his legacy. What the songs he's given the world. Oh, my God. Yeah. Dick, you know, it's... it's, it's but, and the show looks great. Although, like I say, I'm, I have a thing about modern... I've, I, I should point out, I have actually recorded with Elton um, on the Road to El Dorado um, soundtrack that he wrote. Did you? Was that, was, that the, I the, was, yeah, I did. was that the soap opera? <laughs> <laughs> No, it could have been. Right, go on. <laughs> um, no, but that thing with big shows, I, and uh, this is no disrespect to Patrick, who is an absolute genius, but it's, I think where we are with technology is that big events are just, are big events. And it's like, whether it's a gig or a kind of an iPhone launch or mm. anything, everything is this world of screen. Everything looks mm. like mm. Times Square or Piccadilly Circus, or even mm. you, you want to go and see Hockney, you have to go and be immersed in a world of screens of, no, you know. You're, and I, you're right. wonder but, if the you're yeah. right. You think the performance might suffer. Okay, so there is a distraction level, you know, when the videos are running and they look incredible, you know, and let's not yeah. forget, you know, Elton's really been involved in modern art for a long time. You know, he collects photographs. That's very true. <clears throat> There's a fantastic song where they show lots of Martin Parr photographs of the seaside. You know, we, I love, you know, love, love his Yeah, yeah. But it does, it does take away a little bit from that, but you're filling the O2. You've got to fill the O2 or a stadium. Now, how can you reach the back, you know? Okay, so there's plenty of Elton on the screen playing and the band playing, but I, I'm not sure, you know, whether that's what Elton wanted all the time. I think he really loves his visuals. But yeah, if you want what you're suggesting, you really need to go and see him at the Palladium, don't you? If he ever would ever That's the that. thing, yeah, because it's the thing, because it's... There was, especially when you get to stadium, and the O2 is, but this O2 is kind of like an arena that's sort of almost like a stadium in terms of playing. Because when it gets to stadiums, there are so few people who can actually. I mean, you see it when you see the Stones. We see how Mick is just trying to reach every person in the stadium all the time. You know, yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah, yeah. And which he yeah. does, but there's whereas people do it otherwise. You know, it's very few. You know, Bono can do it. Bowie, of course, famously did it. It's one yeah. person who I really surprised me when he did it actually was Elvis Costello was when I saw him at the Tennis Centre in Melbourne years ago. And it, this place is huge, cavernous. You know, Pink Floyd played there. And he just did it with a three-piece, and he turned it into a nightclub. He absolutely pulled you in. That's another... And just made the Amazing. room tiny. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's... that's, another... that's that, that, I mean, obviously, Elton has a, a, the problem of being sort of sat at his piano. You know, he can't prowl the stage. You know, well, yeah, he, yeah. He, well, he, used, <laughs> he used to sort of fly. I mean, the other thing that come, you come away from from that show is his loyalty to musicians. You know, Nigel Olsen still on drums. That's you right, know, Davey, Davey Johnson. Davey Johnson, Ray Cooper, who's godlike, you know, on percussion. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> There's an album that I've been playing my kids. I can never remember what it's called because it's a date. It's something of November, so something 1170. And it's, it's Elton and Nigel Olsen and... His original bass player, whose name escapes me, oh, passed God. away. Oh, now you're embarrassing me. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. Twitter will tell us, or, was or Instagram. Um, and and it's just the three of them, and they're like, he's 23 years old, and he's playing in a radio station in front of an audience, small audience. Take me to the pilot's been written. They do a version of Honky Tonk Women that is unbelievable. And what you realise is, oh. 23, this much talent, this guy deserves to be a superstar still. Yeah, absolutely. That's so, so all I'm and saying, right? What I love, you know that he can't play, he can't play an octave on the piano. Because he's short stuff. He can't hands. reach an octave. Really? That's it. That, it just goes to show. I think Simply Red had a show designed by Patrick Woodruff. I'm sure they did. Uh, now, Simply Red, this is, uh, going back through the catalogue, 
such, I mean, apart from exquisitely crafted songs, but always, always superb arrangements and production. Yeah. Like really, really beautifully finished yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, Stuart Levine produced a lot of them, didn't he? Stuart, that's right. Stu- Levine, Levan, uh, Levine, Levine. Thank you. Uh, no, and he, he, you know, he came out of that. That he was an American soul producer, wasn't he? Yeah, but didn't he? But he did Culture Club as well, didn't he? No, that's Steve Levine. That's what I said. Steve, <laughs> not the same guy. <laughs> Our audience really trust us, you know. <laughs> no, in fact, because I know Steve Levine's brother is David Levine, the photographer who lives in Brighton. You tried to sort of get out of it by going sideways. Uh, I thought that was a beautiful bit of tap dancing, personally. <laughs> um, so, so Mick Hucknall, you know, I mean, that boy came along with such an incredible, you know, voice, didn't he? Blue-eyed soul, as they called it. Yeah, exactly. And... Uh, also, I know, unfortunately, that gig's going to come up, isn't it? Do you know it might come up? <laughs> <laughs> but annoyingly, I think he saw the pistols. No, that's what I'm going to say. Two months saw... before no. me. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> I love him already. <laughs> Let's get him on. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I've been sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. Well, I get the feeling that us three should go for a pint. That's what I think. I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah, so you too, too, too. get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! Thanks, Mick, for coming on. And uh, congratulations on, on, on making a new album and, uh, and getting this out. And, Thank uh, you. We should start with that, really, and how you, um, how you put this one together. Because I, th- I think it was similar to myself. You used COVID to make music. Well, also similar in theme, the thing of looking at who you are, I think, Carrie, isn't it? That's because yeah. it's, yeah. it's very reflective, isn't it, Mick? Well, the thing was, uh, I made an album before uh, COVID called Blue Eyed Soul that was intended to go out on the road. It was quite up tempo and really designed to be played on a stage. And then the inevitable COVID happened. We cancelled the tour, rescheduled it, cancelled again. Yeah. And I think we rescheduled we... it one more time. And and by yeah. then, we just felt that the album was buried. And wh- why I mentioned that is, is that album was effectively a tribute to African-American music. Even though I was the same, Mick, because that album, I'm sorry, because the one thing that comes across from that album is fun. Like you were just yeah. really, really having fun with the everything down to the artwork, the black exploitation poster look of it. Exactly. Everything. We wanted to take yeah. it out on the road and be able to play three or four new songs and it didn't matter if people didn't know them because there was a beat and they could move, you know, they could dance. And effectively, that was a tribute to African-American music. People like James Brown, Otis Redding. And even though I wrote the songs, it was kind of in it, an homage to that. So it got buried because of COVID. And then I, I'm sat there, probably like you, in, in my room, dressing room, bedroom, whatever. And I'm just sort of thinking, well, OK, What makes you tick? You know, who are you then? How do you fit in with the world? As you're looking at this disaster unfolding on television, I'm sat there with an acoustic guitar just strumming away thinking, well, I'll get better at playing guitar at least. And and all of a sudden, you know, a song came, like uh, the the last track on the album, actually, Earth in the Lonely Space, was the first song I wrote. It's very psychedelic. It's got a great 60s vibe to it. Though. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, as, as I said, I'm not really thinking to uh, pay tribute to anybody at that stage. I'm just thinking, well, do something that you want to do. do sh- show people who you actually are and forget about paying tributes or doing anything like that. And if that, if that comes through, as you just described, that's probably because... I grew up in that shit. You know, I grew up in the 1960s and lived through probably the one of the great renaissance periods of, of art. You know, I mean, I, I just I really think that, you know, that this period of the 60s from about 
1960 to some 1980. And I know I know we're eighties artists, but I still look back and think the sixties and seventies wiped the floor with us, really, for creativity and genius. And they've survived more than anybody else, of course. Yeah, you know. yeah. So I, if that's the influence, then it's because I was there. Is is that how you feel about? Have you always felt that about your singing and your contribution to music that it's paying usually is paying homage to someone? Well, certainly if you do a cover. You know, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I always prefer the originals, whether I've done them or not. You know, uh, if you don't know me by now, which was a big hit for us, I still prefer Harold Melvin and Teddy Pendergrass singing it. You know, it, they're just they're just tributes. Yeah, they're tributes. But your own songs is a whole different thing with your own songs. I think what I was trying to get at is that this idea of of you know especially when you first started and when 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 I was making records like true you know it was white boys doing that kind of music hadn't really been taken very seriously and 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 suddenly we were making it our own but was there a sort of wasn't a guilt about that was there well i think you were massively influenced by david bowie weren't you yeah, but that period that I'm talking about now was it's it, you're talking more. I'm talking more Al Green, more, more Marvin yeah. Gaye. You know that. Because I, I was. I'm also God. thinking about young Americans, and yes, and, yes. and the way in which British artists have throughout the years, uh, including American artists like Elvis and Frank Sinatra, they've all taken influence from African American music and and done something with it. That made, I still think of David Bowie doing Golden Years on Soul Train, this, this skinny little white boy playing soul music. You know, mm. it's 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 just something that was around us all the time, and uh, and that applies to all all three of us, I would imagine. But don't you think that thing from the? Because I always had this theory from the sixties that basically America and essentially Black America would come up with these forms, which would then make their way over to England, and then we turn it into songs and sell it back to them. Yeah, but the nice thing is, you know, it, it's it, it, it's kind of cross-pollination as well, you know? Oh, no, that's what I, I mean as an utterly positive thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking yeah. of Ray Charles singing Eleanor Rigby. And, and, uh, and yeah. you know... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Aretha Franklin doing Bridge Over Trouble Water. It's, it's a cross-pollination thing. And that's true. That, Otis doing Satisfaction. Yeah, that's, yeah. What, I, that's what I love about yeah. the whole thing, you know? No, I just... Because that term, Blue-Eyed Soul, sort of slightly fascinated me. I went down a bit of a rabbit hole on that because I feel sorry for the white boys who sing soul and have got green eyes because green-eyed soul just doesn't <laughs> seem to work. But, but, <laughs> but, but it, apparently... P people trace it back to a DJ. I don't know if you know, guys know about this. Called Georgie Woods, who, who was on a Philly radio, and in 1964, he was playing the Righteous Brothers, and he 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 needed to let his audience know that these guys weren't black. So he coined the phrase "Blue Eyed Soul," and it was a kind of code, really. But but it was it was interesting because then after that, the people who were called Blue Eyed Soul singers were like Sonny and Cher and and Tom Jones even. Hall and Oates was where I first heard it in the seventy abandoned luncheonette. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, yeah. I actually chose the title just to throw it back at them, actually, because it is it is termed as being, it was seen as being a slightly derogatory uh, term. But but you know, I mean, I, again, I'll just go back to the Beatles' second album. Uh, You've really got a hold on me by Smokey and, Smokey Robinson. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The the whole of the 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 first Beatles album, uh, well, not the whole of it, but many of those are R&B covers. Arthur, yeah, Al yeah. Arthur Alexander. So I, I, I don't think there's a blue-eyed member of the Beatles, but but they certainly, you know, edge that way, don't they? That's it. We're t I mean, they were into Tamla, weren't they? Those kids were buying Tamla Motors. Exactly. And, exactly. and then, you've got the, then you've got the Who. Yeah. You know, Stacks. We're also... they, yeah. they were massively into Stax and Booker T and the NGs. You know, I remember when I did these dates with um, with Ronnie Wood when I was replacing, I temporarily replaced Rod Stewart in the faces for a couple of a couple amazing a, a short period. I saw you, Mick. Real. I yeah, saw well, you on. I was I was working on the Rob Brydon show, and I ah, saw you appear on that. Brilliant. It was great. Yeah. I loved it. I loved <laughs> it. Well, the thing, the reason why I mention it is, is that um, the late Ian McLagan 
and you know, and Ronnie oh. and Kenny, they were just talking about Booker T and the MGs. They just said, yeah, well, yeah. we started it. We started out listening to that, you know, and we thought that rhythm was really great, you know, and, and you could hear it in the music, you know. It's not blue-eyed soul. It's all over the place. It's just completely yeah, like yeah. a like a beautiful virus, you know, that went everywhere. Do, do you know what I also found out? This is my, and then all my boring stuff is out and gone, right? So we can just get on with the good, <laughs> good stuff about Mick. But who do you, does anyone know who the first British artist to sign to Tamla Motown was? There you uh, go. Keep, well, I'd guess on, Ar Ardeen Taylor because he's the only person I know that. Oh, no, you're you're you're, you're wrong. But is it's it Ardeen Taylor. No, it's Kiki D. Oh, Kiki D, God bless her. Yeah, don't uh, go breaking my heart, my Kiki. Oh, yeah. <laughs> amazing. But Ardeen Taylor, that was a great record, wasn't it? Yeah, there's a ghost in my house. Yeah, that's a, I used to dance oh, to that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I used to do twirls and never did the somersaults, but those backflips and stuff. Can't do it now, but good then. Because <laughs> you DJed from very early on, didn't you, Mick? Did yeah, you I, used, I used to have a... Did I have that wrong? Yeah. I used to have a show on Wednesday nights at Manchester Polytechnic um, called Black Rhythms. And that was when I was uh, 20, 21. And uh, the poster is a picture of Charlie Parker on it. And I used to play music uh, as far back as the 40s, like Louis Jordan, some blues oh, stuff, Sonny Boy Williamson, Muddy Waters. But at the same time, I'd be playing Shalimar and all, all manner of stuff, Dennis Edwards and stuff like that. All floor fillers, yeah. with just the insertions of these occasional obscure things that they'd love to dance to as well. So I'd get like seven hundred people in there a night. It was fantastic. Something that we we can all you know about the seventies and youth culture in the seventies is that we all seem to become parts of different tribes very quickly. Like for me, one minute I was I was a punk, then I was a, a Bowie kid, and then I was a soul boy. You know, and and it didn't seem to none, none the gears never seemed to crash. At any time, it all seemed to be really fluid and happen naturally. But it just gave me access to all different genres of music. Well, it's. I think we're all in the mutual David Bowie fan club. And what, yeah. one of the things that I really loved about um, being a teenager at school uh, was was being literally thrilled to bits to wonder what David Bowie was going to do next. You know, yeah. right right from the moment where my friend Christian Broomhead played me Ziggy Stardust in when I was 12. He bought mm. it. He bought it on a Saturday morning. We played it in his house for the first time. And I've always thought with, that he was that kind of guy that could take something, but he always made it his own. You know, he always kind of did something with it that wasn't so obvious. And uh, that, that's what I really admire about people that can take musicians that can take something and make it their own and you don't you don't look there and think oh i know exactly what he's doing but no he's doing something else you know and that that's a, a real challenge uh, to try and do with your work yeah because obviously bowie went from electronica to soul to you know to to the almost punk as well in those early days of iggy pop influence records i mean he you he validated everything that we allowed ourselves to do Absolutely right. He yeah. did indeed. Yeah, that's why he's so. That's why he's so admired now. I think we we need to talk about your early days then, really, don't we? Um, I mean, we do. And I, and um, yes, we know where we go. There's a gig, isn't there? There's a gig that's going to have to rear its ugly head. <laughs> he's only saying this, Mick, because virtually every week <laughs> I mention that I saw the Sex Pistols, and I also mention that he didn't. Yeah. So 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 we. <laughs> That's a significant uh, gig for you too, isn't it? Well, I saw, I saw them a few times. So the the oh, I'm always I'm always very confused by this whole thing uh, because there was more than one gig at the Lesser Free Trade Hall. There was two. Ah, there was ah. Two, no one ever talks about it. And is that um, one, one with Matt Lock? No, it's Vicious. just it's just it's just the one with, and there were eighteen of you in the room, and every single one. Well shaped the 80s right i you know the, the 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 way people put importance on this is a bit bizarre really because in all honesty i didn't remember that 
you know the the one the one that I always remember that was more vivid in my memory was um was the show that they did at the Electric Circus when where because uh, and I think that was because of the lineup uh, uh, that that show and the lineup was um the Sex Pistols the Buzzcocks the Clash the Damned who didn't turn up um and um slaughter and the dogs the fall this was all on one bill at the oh my god this is a festival at the electric <laughs> at the electric circus and that was the year after that was in 1977 and that's the yeah. one i remember more than the what the, the previous one uh, now my, it... my my oldest friend neil who i've known since i was three years old who, who i gave a songwriting credit to on holding back the years he didn't write any of holding back the years but we used to write songs together and just for the sheer memory, I gave him that. But he and I would go out to the clubs, um, and it was actually his elder brother who said to us, I'd just seen a band called the Sex Pistols. You've got to come and see them. So he went to the very first one. Now, my my memory is blurred in the second one because of uh, the 77 gig. But apparently we went to the next one, me and Neil went to the next free trade or gig. But it's all a blur to me. And but, think, but hang on, was Sid Vicious playing or was it Glenn Matlock? No, no, no. Sid, uh, Sid, the time I saw Sid Vicious um, in my memory was at a gig in Hudders, Huddersfield, which was the, 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 I think the third time I saw them. As far as I remember, Glenn Matlock... Blimey, I, think, I think you saw every gig practically. Ever did. Well... I, I've seen them. I saw them a few. I'm, look, my, I was more into the Buscocks, to be honest. Yeah, right. Um, Howard Devoto. Yeah, because when Howard Devoto was with them, Neil and I thought they were going to be the next Beatles. We we just thought they were amazing. Wow. Uh, and then we witnessed them have a big fight on the stage, which was hilarious. Because what I, happened? It was like a. It was like handbags. It was just they, they, <laughs> they were they weren't really fighting. They were sort of flapping. Oh, what, sort of... uh, they were, you know, <laughs> they, there were no punches. They were sort of slapping. It was like a handbag fight. It was hilarious. It was an art that, school fight. And that was like the last, I think that was the last gig they did together. And then... Oh, so you witnessed the split. You saw the actual split. Well, we didn't realise that, that it was <laughs> yeah. at the time, but I think it was, yeah. It was very... It was hilarious. But, but that split, that split you saw created post-punk because Howard goes off and makes magazine, and that's... Well, got yeah. Your, 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 and yeah. and uh, the Frantic Elevators, my first band, opened for magazine on their, on their, on their very first tour. They did a show at a club called Rafters, and we'd been invited. Oh. We'd been invited to open for them, and we were massive fans. And, and in fact, Barry Adamson, who was the bass player, yeah, and John McGeoch, the late John McGeoch, who passed, I think, oh, last year. Fantastic, the legendary John yeah. McGeoch. Yeah. I have to tell you, they were so lovely to us. You know, we were like seventeen-year-old spotty little kids, and we thought these guys were like superstars. But they were so nice. They were really supportive. And you never forget you never forget things like that, do you? You know, when people have been when you're starting out and certain people really give you the push up and, and give you help up, it, it really uh, it really stuck with me that they were great. As well as uh, Mark Smith from The Fall as well was also very lovely. Uh, we, we, we toured with them briefly. So we had some great adventures early on. But in were, you, were, you in, you in, were you involved in all, in, in all of that Manchester sort of post-punk scene? Was, was Factory in your view and well factory were t <laughs> factory was so fucking miserable it was all it was all like <laughs> black black and gloom and you know right. dark darkness we were happy go lucky kids you know we half of our time we'd spend we'd, we'd rehearse for a couple of hours and then we'd be off to the pub you know we, we were we were having a great laugh yeah renting renting a transit van going up and down you know, doing John Peel sessions and stuff, going up and down the M1. It, to, to us, it was it was the most wonderful thing, and we thought, what are they so miserable about? Uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. which is which is brilliant. But what's interesting, even just in that, it's very interesting how it's so Manchester because in your vocal, there's little snippets of. It's funny you bring up. There's definitely a bit of Marky Smith and John Cooper Clark. Yeah, who I really admired, and, and yeah. I mean, I think Mark Mark Smith was a genius. You know, he, his uh, yeah. 
he had this way of representing his culture in 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 the lyrics and stuff you know i can't describe it it just was so part of where i grew up he represented what we were living in better than anybody it was magnificent but what stands out when you listen back to those uh, early um, frantic elevator uh, singles is 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 holding back the years that which you do as a band then it's got a funny it's got that great sort of baritone type guitar in it it's almost like a richard hawley type thing but you are so ahead of the curve i was Nick. gonna say yeah the, you are it's the song is so much more sophisticated than the band yeah the song and the singer and your, yeah well that yeah. was the inevitable evolution you know we were we were living in a in a flat in human moss side which is you know, I don't know if you know, it's oh, yeah, yeah. pretty much yeah, the yeah, roughest, yeah. roughest part of Manchester. And we kept getting burgled and we had an axe by the side of the door. And I mean, it was just un unbelievable, really. But but there came a point, I'm 21 and I'm thinking, shit, you know, is this how it's going to be? I, I've got to get out of here. You know, the, something's mm -hmm. something's got to give. Something's got to change. And, and uh, then I met... Um, my manager, who became the Simply Red manager, Elliot. Elliot Rashman. Yeah, yeah I met him through, uh, who was my, fir my first actual manager, was a guy called Roger Eagle. And, and, oh, no way! And Roger. The legend. Yeah. Now, Roger and I were very, we were very close. Um, uh, and uh, for, for several years, you know, I, I consider him, there's two real people I consider to be my real mentors. One of them is Roger Eagle, and another guy who I met later on called Nessie Ertigan. And, and he, was, he was the brother of Armit Ertigan, who were the co-founders co of Atlantic Records. Now, Nessie was more jazz-orientated, and, uh, and he took a real shine to me early on as well. But, but Roger, a few years before then, introduced me to a whole world of rhythm and blues. I mean, I was into well, his, He was famous for his record collection, oh, wasn't he? Tell, tell me about him, yeah. Guy. Why do you know him? He's, oh, he's a legendary Liverpool... Well, he's a Liverpool character, isn't he, rather than well, he, Manchester? He wasn't a scouser, actually. He, he's, he's, ah. he's, he was uh, from a middle-class family. His, his mother was a, um Oxford uh, intellectual. I think she was a, a teacher at Oxford University. Uh, and um, wow. so he, I think he originally came from that area... But he moved up. He ran a club in Manchester called the Twisted Wheel, which was a That's famous right, yeah. Northern Soul club. And then when psychedelia happened, he ran a club called the Magic Village. Um, and then from the Magic Village, he really latched on to what was happening with the the, the punk scene. I believe the Pistols played Eric's. He, he, Eric's club was was Rogers. I think the yeah. first U two gig on mainland uh, Britain was uh, Eric's, if I remember correctly. So mm. he, he was incredibly influential. And so when we were starting out, he took a real shine to the Frantic Elevators, loved us, um, would always get us gigs whenever he could, opening for people. And at that time, Liverpool was buzzing as well because I got friendly mm. with Echo and the Bunny Men, with McCulloch and um, Pete Wiley out of Wahi. And they were all... They were all going to Roger's gigs. We'd always be there and, you know, playing his amazing jukebox and stuff. And I used to spend a lot of time with Roger um, after the shows and he'd be playing me music. We'd be smoking bits of hashish and listening to dub reggae and Bobby Bland and James Brown. It was absolutely wow. incredible for me. He was your he, teacher. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I love him. To, I loved him to bits, but he couldn't manage a paper bag. He was bloody useless as a manager. God bless him, and he knew that. He knew it, and that's mm -hmm. when he passed me on to Elliot Rashman, and then my world I, changed. I, I just want to step. Who was who was Elliot doing? Was Elliot was a proper manager? No, well, when, when Elliot Elliot, Elliot had managed a band called the Moth Men, who signed to oh, right. signed to Virgin Records very briefly. But he was an entertainment officer at Manchester Polytechnic. It was the Moth, was Moth, Moth Men had nothing to do with Vinnie Riley, did it? Um, I, to... I think there were, I think there were sort of connections. Yeah, there was a whole little scene of uh, these musicians around around East Man, around Didsbury, and they all kind of knew each other. 
and they're, I think they're all uh, kind I've... of interconnected. I think the link there, Gary, that you're thinking is that is because uh, I think in the original lineup of Simply Red, you had guys from Girotti, Cullum, and the Mothman. Oh, oh, right. That's right. right. Yeah. Correct. Right. Okay. 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 Yeah. I just want to step back a little bit, uh, Mick, to you as a songwriter and you writing "Holding Back the Years" because it's an interesting story because it, it goes right back to your childhood, doesn't it? Well, um, I'd learned to. I was learning to play guitar when I when I wrote that song. Um, I, I I think I knew about three chords uh, when I wrote it. Um, it was the second song I wrote, and I wrote it in my dad's house in my bedroom, and I had no idea what the song was about. That, that's the weirdest thing sometimes. You, you, you write almost in the subconscious state, and it's not sometimes you look back at the lyric and you suddenly go, oh, my God, look what I just did. I had no idea. And, and, and I've sorry because there's, there's one line I've got to focus in, which is uh, strangled by the wishes of Pater, longing for the arms of Mater is so unbelievably powerful and heartbreaking. Well, I don't you must have known what you were saying then, or I, I, I don't ju- know. I, I just think I'd probably seen something on the television that that was <laughs> influential of it. You know, it could have been Brideshead revisited, it could have been anything. I've no idea, right? You know, your maybe, mother, your, mo- I, your I mother don't left go home. Around I don't go around calling my dad Peter. Oh my <laughs> no, 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 that's true. No, the wording certainly not. But it, but it, but that does describe exactly. Uh, I mean, it describes where you grew up, doesn't it? I mean, it was, it was, well, there was no you know, your house. There was no mate. There was no mother. There was no mater yeah. and Peter in East Manchester. But you know, for some no, reason, but I, no, but in terms of mother and father. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Right. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I don't mean well, mater and Peter. <laughs> I mean, I have no explanation as to why I wrote Mater and Pater, I guess, because they rhymed. I, it's just incredible yeah. to think that I, I, I didn't sort can of... I, can I, you, don't even, you don't even notice that. You just don't even notice that. Can yes. I offer Can I, I offer a, 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 a possible reason you did that, Mick? Because obviously this is your... Your mum left home when you were three and, 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 and you were brought up by your dad. But maybe if you'd said, you know, father, mother or mum and dad, it would have made it too real for you. You exactly. Just, mm, no, removing agree. yourself. Yeah. It's it's almost too obvious, isn't it? That, that you would. I agree. Yeah. I thought that, that would that was probably my thinking. Yeah, I believe that. So so this so let's talk about the the forming of Simply Red out because really it's it's is it a band? Has it ever been a band? I mean that's my key question, Mick. You know, or is it really always you? Well, I mean, I could say the same about yourself, Gary. Aren't you the principal writer? <laughs> Weren't you the principal writer in Sandow Ballet? <laughs> Yes, yes, of course. Well, you know, I think there we share a parallel because I think both of us would have wanted to be in a band. Part of the tradition of, Brit- of Britain as in our generation growing up was the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin. Mm. These were the people we looked up to. And I just so desperately wanted to be in a band. And, you know, I started out writing all the songs without really thinking about it because I just naturally, I'm a natural songwriter. That's what I do. And the problem came about when the success happened because my manager is tearing his hair out saying, when are you guys going to write some songs? Mick's the only one that's writing any songs. And it became more and more worrying when they realized that the songwriter makes most, most of the cash. And they all start, they all, they said, I've got a studio, I've got a studio in my, in my flat. And I'm still writing songs on an acoustic guitar and a Walkman until about 1995. So mm. I don't even need <laughs> no studio. You know, I don't need anything. I'm, I, I, in fact, sometimes I don't even need a guitar. You know, I just sing the song into my phone. So, so but the bottom line is this. There was no other songwriters in the band. And I got singled out more and more and more to the extent that they began to even resent me because I was writing songs. I mean, how oh, fucked yeah. up is that? You know? <laughs> so, you know, I walk in the room and there's silence, that kind of shit. And uh, I just thought, oh. this is not, this is not, where I des- not what I deserve and it's not where I should be. So, in essence, Simply Red is a vehicle for my songwriting. And it wasn't out of choice. That's how it evolved. I had no say in it. As I said, the manager of the band, Elliot, 
was trying his best to encourage the rest of the band to write songs. But if it was so easy, we'd all be doing it, wouldn't we? It's not. It's not. Songwriting is, is a gift in itself, and I'm very lucky to be able to sing and to write songs, and that's the way it is. Was there a thing where it came to a head with the first lineup, or was there a sort of well, gradual it, thing? That was, that, was what, that was actually quite amusing, because um, in the late 80s... Slapping on stage! My, <laughs> no, no. my, uh, my manager's lawyers said to them, if you don't change the contract, Mick's lawyers are eventually going to recommend to him that he sues you for mismanagement. And so they acted upon their advice of their own legal team, not mine. And they came to me and said, we have to renegotiate your deal because you're doing all the work and they're getting equal shares and it's not fair. And sooner or later, you're going to sue us for mismanagement. And that's how it evolved. So... By, by the time I came to write the album Stars, that was just before then was when the renegotiation happened. And, um, you know, I, I was very romantic. In some respects, I still am. I just wanted to be in a band. I thought, John Paul, mm-hmm. George and Ringo, you know, but where was my John? Where where were they? They, were, mm-hmm. they weren't there. They weren't there. I mean, the name of the band obviously was so great because it focused on this young kid who's who's got red hair and who 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 is a Labour supporter? Who uh, and supports Man, U. Man United? <laughs> uh, uh, it was it was it was a perp, but it, it it did focus on you as a frontman completely. But let's get let's just talk talk about some, some you know better things if you like sweeter things. I think one of the great skills in in at the beginning of your career was getting in uh, 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 Stuart Levine to Stuart Levine yeah to produce you because he he came out of that whole, whole American soul production. I mean, whose idea was that? I, but I think the credit to that deserves to the to go to a guy called Simon Potts, who who uh, set up with uh, his assistant Saul Galpern, who I'm still friends yeah. with. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I know, yeah, I know yeah, Saul, yeah. I know Saul. And he set uh, he set uh, Electra UK up, um, but I didn't know at the time. But there was a lot of politics involved with Warner Brothers, Electra Atlantic. They were pissed off, and but he he was the one that brought brought Stuart in. Uh, which which was great, you know. I, I got on well with Stuart straight away, and uh, he and I became very close. Uh, so so yeah, I I completely agree. I think it was a great move. Although although actually, when we made Picture Book, we switched producers for the second album because we didn't think that the first album represented how we sounded live. And, uh, you know, the, uh, particularly the rhythm section of the band of Simply Red at that time, bass player and drummer, weren't happy with the, the sound of Picture Book. And um, I kind of felt similarly, and we were wrong. You know, you, you, we were kids and we, we fucked up. Um, it, it, Alex Sadkin, who produced our second album, uh, was, yeah, yeah. was a great producer. Yeah. You know, but he he lived in a sort of a different world. It was it was not it was not really organic. It was it was slightly mechanized and slightly robotic. Did, did, we, well, it was from that sexy compass point. Oh yeah, techno, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Did I you mean, do it there? Did you do the album there? No, no, no. We did it at, at Rack Studios in St John's Wood oh. when mm-hmm. uh, when Mickey Most was still alive. Yeah, uh, and uh, and you know it, it was. I have enormous respect for Alex. You know, he made some incredible records with Grace Jones, especially. Yeah, yeah. He engineered a a few James Brown singles as well, a few of the later James Brown stuff. So Duran Duran, he worked with Duran, didn't he? Yeah, he he had he had he had all the things, but it just didn't. I never really fitted into the eighties. I didn't think. You know, we we were far more suited to the music of the seventies because I wasn't really into drum machines and, and. because like it's interesting that point that you just made, Mick, when when you said we were worried that the record didn't sound like we did live, which is such an un eighties consideration. Yes, well said, absolutely, well said. <laughs> yeah. uh, because we we were really building up a fantastic uh, live reputation. You know, um, I still think of us as predominantly uh, that we're a very successful live band. You know, right from the get-go, we went into the arenas really early on. 
and 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 have stayed there mm -mm. you know and, and that's partly because of the live following you know there are many artists that have great success with their recordings but they can't mm -hmm. they can't fill space they, they they they're still playing little theaters you know um so we really focused on the live stuff and i guess that's probably why we were so concerned about it even at that time can I just say, you, you just reminded me there, Guy, mentioning Robert Palmer, you know, that Sneaking Sally Through the Al Alley album that came out in the 70s. I mean, that must have been a massive influence on you, wasn't it, Mick? I mean, I, that guy was sort of, he was definitely blue-eyed soul. I, I, you must forgive me. I, I was not familiar with Robert Palmer's work at all. and Not, not even at all. The, the, the first oh. thing I ever heard by him was that, uh, the one with the fantastic video. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it, uh, it it to love. Wow. I didn't know him before then. I think the the thing was then, I think I was like some kind of um, religious purist. I was completely, yeah, yeah. I was completely immersed in African American music. Uh, you know, uh, no, I wasn't interested in white boys doing it, including myself. I was kind of so involved in buying stuff up, and especially reggae at that time as well. I, I just was just mad for it. So I was I was in a completely different world at that time. Well, what's what's amazing, and I just want to mention this before we move on, is, is is that holding back, when I read this, I didn't even know this to be the case, that holding back the years came out and flopped and they yeah, got yeah. re-released. And is that obviously became one of the biggest records of all time. You know, I mean, you know, two years running the most played record. I mean, it's what happened? <laughs> what was the difference between the flop and the success? Well, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't very 80s, was it? If you think it about must have, it. it. Did a DJ grab it? Is that what it was? Well, apparently so. Um, it happened, according to legend, um, I have Huey Lewis in the news to thank. Uh, they were, That's a phrase you don't hear every day. I know, they, were, they were friends <laughs> with Stuart Levine. In fact, I think Stuart later produced an album with them or did an album with them. But right. anyway, they, they came over to the UK and toured around about 1985, 1986. And when they went back to California, they were doing an interview in San Francisco, I believe. And uh, the guy asked him, said, well, you know, when you were over there in the UK, did you hear any new music and stuff or something? And they said, yeah, we heard this album by this band, Simply Red. And this this song, uh, we love this song here. And they played the song on the this this radio station. Uh, and um, they got such fantastic feedback from their listenership that, you know, they played it again. And then another station picked it up. And it's very romantic, you know, Um and, that really uh, is. and the truth is the record company had nothing to do with it. And and, and that really tarnished my relationship anyway with uh, the American record company because I never thought that they fully got behind us. You know, they never quite got it. We, the single did amazingly well and we got another number one um, a couple of albums later, but they never really did much with the album. And, and consequently, you know, we tour over there and break even, you know, a seven-piece band would really struggle mm -hmm. to make a decent living if you're from the UK in America because you can't make money unless you're playing arenas. So we, we'd go over there and play these theatres, do about 30 shows, come home knackered and, and broken even. And by then, we were already playing arenas in the UK and Holland and Germany and Italy. We were already playing nine, ten thousand 10,000 people. And so our managers just said, we don't need to go back to America. You're making a fantastic living in Europe. You don't need to worry about America. Forget about America. And so we did. You know, we just couldn't be bothered. If you're like Led Zeppelin or you too, there's four of you. You know, it's a hell of a lot easier than having seven. That's that's three less airplane tickets, three less hotel rooms. You know, mm -hmm. it really is not sustainable when you've got that amount of people. It's funny, isn't it? Because obviously that's the case financially then. But having American successful singles from them, or even though in the 80s, now pays dividends, doesn't it? Because they're, you know, that's racking up your Spotify, your streaming, etc. You know, it's, it's, now it's the time it pays back. Well, you couldn't be, you're absolutely correct, Gary. Um, I am shocked uh, 
by the impact that we've had on those streaming services and some of the uh, i think it's our second biggest market in on spotify is america uh, so uh, so do you send still, Huey Lewis a Christmas card every it's year? Still not e- <laughs> <laughs> it's still not economically feasible for me to tour there. Uh, I'm, I, wow. I'm too long in the tooth, man. You know, I, I, I'm sort of like, I'll do two months a year, but I love being at home with my wife and kid. I'm a family guy. I, I just love being at home. You're not going to get me out for more than two months a year. And so you, you can spend you can spend three months just touring America. You know, yeah. uh, so that. But you, you've always been very. Your shtick has always been very European, anyway, hasn't? Yeah, it? I, which is. I, I, I've always thought being big in Europe is better than being big in. But I'd much rather have to slog around Europe once yes. a year than slog around America. Frankly. Well, you know, <laughs> slogging around Madrid and Barcelona. That's not. That's perhaps. Yeah. Wrong. Well, exactly. Slog was the wrong word. Exactly. Slog was the wrong word. I, 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 I'm with you. It's a, it's an yeah. absolute delight. You know, Western exactly because you're always somewhere. There's always something. You know, Guy and I something. were on tour together last year in Europe. We yeah. did virtually every country in Europe, and uh, but I think what that really meant to us, Guy, is we we visited every gallery and cathedral, exactly. every museum, every did a, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly how I feel about it. Western Europe is relatively small compared to the United States, but the cultures, the variation. Yeah. In each of the countries, even if they're members of the EU, they still have the originality. And I get such delight out of performing uh, and being in those cities. Like, as you just said, going to a gallery, just walking along a river, whatever. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm happy. Exactly. Because I must say, um, Mick, you were the first. But I remember when Stars came out, right, which were, you know, enormous album. What was so nice, you said it's one of the things about it. You're the first person who I've ever heard sort of say, public out loud as it were that one of the things it was about was what a great thing the european union is and i just remember thinking yeah god yeah i hadn't really thought about that well i just thought it brought people together well absolutely and it did uh you know uh, but let's not even go there i don't let's not uh, go there exactly i'll tell you where we can go it was a little just a little positive move i'll tell you where we can go uh is 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 during this period as well you started writing with lamont dozier and I just wanted to know how that was for you to walk into the room and see him there. Yeah. And what was the process? Well, that was one of the great thrills of my career, I have to say. Um, and that and that happened quite early on, actually, because I was under such pressure uh, to write songs, as I said, because no one else was doing it. When we came to the end of the Picture Book album, uh, we were still touring and I was supposed to get together a whole album of songs by myself, effectively. And, you know, it was still relatively new to me, songwriting. You know, I, I was getting good at it, but I still had a lot to learn. And uh, through the wisdom of Stuart Levine and my manager, Elliot, we, Stuart was, was uh, Stuart actually produced that wonderful song by Lamont, Going Back to My Roots, the original version oh, of it. So oh, good. Yeah. So and, good. And oh, it's yeah. magnificent. I don't know if you've got the 12 inch single, the extended version. It's absolutely <laughs> glorious, you know. And uh, he recommended that I meet up with Lamont. And uh, I, I was thrilled. You know, I mean, Jesus Christ, I, I must have had about 15 or 20 uh, Motown singles that I'd didn't even know Lamont wrote that I had, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I started looking at them going, Holland does you, holy shit, this guy's amazing. And I got the chance. And so um, one morning in Los Angeles, I I got in a cab, went down to Lamont's home in Sherman Oaks, California, uh, Mm -hmm. which I I always thought was very funny because I had a Lenny Bruce sketch um, about this uh, place in Sherman Oaks was where all the Jewish people lived in California. So there I'm with Lamont Dozier in Sherman Oaks. I thought that was hilarious at the time. But anyway, <laughs> I, go, I go in the other side of the hill. I go into yeah. his space, and um, so Lamont was kind of like a Tin Pan Alley type guy. You know, he'd have his breakfast, and he would literally just sit in front of the piano like a job. You know, every morning he'd go into his little room and start banging out ideas on the piano every morning. So I went in there and joined him, uh, thrilled to bits, you know, like a little kid in a sweet shop. And he was very kind of brotherly and paternalistic with me. He was very, very kind and, 
you know, just really lovely, very, very warm person and funny too. Very dry, dry sense of humor, which I, I really appeals to me. Um, so we, I, the, the funniest part of it was I had to control the guy. He, he, he was like, like a machine. I've got, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And, as, as I've got the tape recording, pressing the thing. He's moved on to the next idea. I said, wait, wait, slow down. <laughs> he goes, come back, come back, come back here. Yeah, repeat that, do that again, do that again. And so he gave me about sort of 20 bars of a, of a riff that I'd record, and then there'd be something else. So by the time I walked out of, the, of his place after two or three hours, I had about sort of, it was a, a complete mess on my cassette machine. It was just all, there was like five or six mm -hmm. ideas, no structure, no lyrics, but just these, a lot of melody and a lot of riffs. And um, out of that. Well, that's chord, but his chords are amazing. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. So yeah. I then went away and created songs out of them, right. effectively. Uh, and we did two two of his songs are on the the second album, the Men and Women album, Infidelity, and uh, it was a song called Suffer. And then the best part came when I did another two songs with him on the New Flame album, the third album, which was one of my favourite songs we ever wrote together called You've Got It, and yeah, which is yeah, a yeah. really yeah. beautiful kind of soul ballad, um, and that was a delight. But but I could. When you look at the songwriting credit, Holland, Dozier, Holland, oh, after yeah. having worked with Lamont, you know exactly what Holland and Holland did because they were the, they would put the things together because Lamont was just an ideas man and you had to put him in order. You had to, you know what I mean? You had to put him in, in, in a box to, to control the ideas because it, otherwise you'd end up with like 500 riffs and no songs, you know? Mm -mm -mm. So that was effectively and, how and, it worked and, with me and Lamont. And this is what led to that rather, it's, one could say cheeky uh, songwriting credit. Yeah, well, I did it again. It was <laughs> cheeky. Uh, he, his, his wife was furious with me um, uh, uh, about that. But the truth is, he, he, he didn't he, he didn't really write, the songs he, he gave hang on, me. Hang on, you, you need to fit. Yeah, we should. Sorry, we need you to need tell to our listeners. In on this. Minute, because, because, yeah, because uh, uh, the standard songwriting credit for him is Holland Dozier Holland. Right. And your songs, Mick, I believe, are credited to Hucknall Dozier Hucknall. Yeah. <laughs> Which, again, it was pure tongue in cheek. Yeah. In, actual, <laughs> in actual fact, it was real. Because Lamont didn't write any of the lyrics, I wrote all of the lyrics. Um, and I wrote all the melodies on top of the riffs. You know what I mean? Mm -mm. So, right. all the, so, so, all, so he all didn't sit there melody. singing. He wouldn't mm -hmm. sing a melody to you, and you took that away. He was just really just banging it out, and you were singing the melody, right? Yeah. Uh, well, he, he did a little bit. Um, I remember on the song Infidelity, he was a, <laughs> you know, it's a bit like that, you know. But I had to kind of put the structure together. I had to, I had to organize the arrangement. So. I thought it actually it was a fair deal, um, in fact. Uh, but when we came to do the third album, they were so pissed off that I just said, OK, I'll go 50-50, even though you've not written any of the lyrics, even though you've not written hardly any of the melodies on top of the chords, whatever. Out of sheer respect and admiration, fine, you know? I mean, there was never any weirdness between me and Lamont, but God bless his wife, she's a Rottweiler, and she was protecting her husband's interests, and I, 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 I don't, I don't even hold that against her. Fair enough, you know, no big deal. I'd, but I, I, it was a wonderful experience with him, and he was a great, great uh, person and uh, a lovely, lovely personality too. After um, Star, I mean Stars, I mean something like twelve times platinum in the UK. I mean it's a, it's best-selling album two years running, wasn't it? Nineteen ninety-one, nineteen ninety-two. How do you? How do you? I, go to the next what do you album. do what do you do how do you go yeah. to the next album and how did it how did it treat how did you feel as such a huge celebrity who you know let's face it as we suffered too was kind of getting no respect from 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 the artier journalists you know from the old rock journalists but was a massive act but how do you follow it up and how were you dealing with it 
uh, that's a, a really great question. My, my first instincts to answer it was was that one of the successes of Stars came about to something we just previously talked about, which was the live reputation. We were we were you know from 1985 to 1990, I was pretty much on tour all of the time, and we were building up an incredible following, uh, a, a, a live following. So by the time Stars came out, there was a great deal of anticipation from from everybody that regularly went to see us live. So that impact hit really well at the beginning of the project. Um, plus also, I realise now that I, I, I composed three or four really strong radio-friendly tracks. Like Something Got Me Started, Stars, especially those two really kicked it kicked it in um mm. and and uh it was just one of those things wasn't it? It, it you know every every artist has their moments you know the beatles had their sergeant pepper and i guess my my uh, to my equivalence stars was kind of that it was that moment you know i suppose you'd say that with true uh, and yeah. that, that time with yours and you you have to kind of surrender to it I think, you know, you can't just start resenting it, resenting your own success. You think, okay, that was, that was the moment, you know, it doesn't mean to say you have to stop. You still keep trying to do it, but I just thought, holy shit, how am I ever going to follow that? You know, um, was, especially, was there... as we, especially as we were still touring, you know, we didn't stop touring till the end of 1992. We toured stars for two years uh, and, mm. and then, I had to sort of, I was knackered uh, and I came home and thought, well, I better, I got to start writing songs, you know, and um, it just was incredibly challenging. But it feels like, yeah. it feels like the eighties went up till about 93 and I would present Suede as being like the band that came along and invented the nineties. And it sort of happened, you know, and for you being a Mancunian with what's coming next, you know, with 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 uh, with Britpop and Oasis, was well, I, 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 actually I see that slight, slightly differently. I, I'm quite unashamed of the mainstream. I thought that the shift uh, <laughs> in the nineties happened with Take That. That 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 that, ah. that was the that was to me mm. where I thought, oh, mm. a new generation are coming through here. Um, I'm not the new generation anymore. I'm now establishment, and then this kind of cute little boy band turns up, and uh, have got uh, and they've got a really good songwriter in Gary Barlow. So, uh, you know, I know that the media and the hip side of the '90s wants to talk about Oasis and Blur and and Suede, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I looked at I looked to take that and thought, well, that's that's a mainstream thing that's really taking off in a big way so while i fully acknowledge what you're saying about suede and oasis and the importance of that it's the way in which people eulogize in manchester about factory records you know like like it's some kind of holy grail but there's still not sold that many albums and they're still not that big globally but the media talk about them like they're the biggest thing on planet earth you mm. know so mm. fair play to them good luck to them but realistically speaking I live in a mass media world. I live I live with mm -hmm. 9,000 people in an auditorium. I don't live in a little club with 200 fanatics. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. I, I just felt yeah. there's more... That's you told, gal. That's no, you told, he's man. right. And, uh, to, <laughs> talking of which, because I went to see Elton John last night, and we mentioned uh, Patrick Woodruff, who designed his show earlier. Oh, yeah. Pat, Patrick Patrick worked with you, didn't he? Did simply he right? did, yeah. He did, and uh, another guy, they did the stars... And the and the light. So in fact, it's funny you mention Elton John because um, when we had the enormous success with Stars, uh, I think I was at some sort of party. Well, I was definitely at a party. And Elton was there, <laughs> and he said he said to me, he says, "You must have been devastated." I couldn't I couldn't figure out if it was a bitchy comment or a nice comment. I was never entirely sure. But he said, "You must have been devastated when Stars didn't go in America." And I thought, well, yeah, I kind of was, but I'd still be touring there if I did. And I sort of thought to myself, no, I don't want to tour there anymore. I'm done, you know. <laughs> so at the same time, I thought it was a bit of a catty remark, 
but nevertheless it was true because it didn't go in america and uh, of course since now it's 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 very popular in america but yeah. at that time it was very upsetting when you'd done something that was so incredibly successful everywhere except america you Did know you yeah <clears throat> that was when was this this was about the, this when you had your first big lineup change wasn't it is this when this when gota came into the band? yeah this was this was my management's kind of godfather moment you know uh, it was it, it it didn't really come from me it came from as i said to you earlier it came from them the night of the long knives where there was fancy like, a drink there was like a reality check no the gota actually is a very interesting case because uh, another band that i thought shaped the beginning of the 90s was uh, soul to soul uh, yeah, and yeah. that that first yeah. that first track keep on moving really hit me because it was the first song it was the first time i'd heard drum programming that sounded organic and you know it got over from that 80s clatter with that massive snare drum you know so many of those like, 80s records they go <laughs> with this backbeat of the snare and for the first time with the work that uh, they were doing, it felt really soft and round and sexy and sensual. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I'd heard drum machines sounded like that. And I said to Stuart Levine, find out who does that stuff. Find out who's doing the programming for them because I want to work with them. And I'd already become friendly with Nelly Hooper, who was involved with them, yeah. who, was, yeah. who was immensely talented, did, did a lot of great work at that period. But the other guy that did it with him was Gota Yoshiki. And, uh, yeah, I'd, I worked with Gota for years. That's why I bring it up. Oh, did, where, where did you work with yeah. him, Guy? I did all sorts of projects with him in London. With the Japanese band, he was in at first. I'll tell you, here's the funniest one. Was at the end of his career, sorry, little sidebar here. At the end of his career, Gary Lineker went and played in Japan. And, and Gota made his football record for Japan, uh -huh. which I played on. And the thing is, for all his many talents and his fabulous worthiness of character, one thing Gary doesn't have is any musical talent uh -huh. at all. You so this entire record, which is based around Gary Lineker, all Gota could get out of him was him saying, one, two, uh, uh, three, uh, Are go. you saying he's not as good a singer as Glenn Hoddle? <laughs> <laughs> no, but so anyway, uh, we ended up, we brought Gota in as a drum programmer. So we our, ah. our, our original drummer was still in the band at that time. And we went over to record in Paris. Um, and uh, Marconi? I can't remember, to be honest. Right. But the, uh, the Gulf War happened all of a sudden. The hotel that we were staying in on that street was the Israeli tourist office the Iranian and Iraqi tourist office, and they shut down the street with all these um, oh, wow. policemen. And it was like wow. we, were, we were working in a fucking war zone, you know? And uh, so we ended up moving uh, from Paris to a place in outside of Venice called Villa Condolma. But anyway, what happened was Gota came in to do the programming and then just casually announced, just, oh, I play drums as well. And I'm like, oh, shit. He, he, so to get that sound, <laughs> he, he programs and plays the drums. So that put me in a very, very difficult yeah. position with my yeah, original yeah. drummer, who'd not taken the time to do any programming. He didn't learn anything about it. He was just a drummer at that time. And that was one of the most difficult decisions in my career because Gota was prepared to tour. He was creating the drum loops because of the playing as well, which made it difficult to have Chris play the drums with him doing the programming when he, his very creations, Gota's very creations were based on playing the drums and the, right. and the programming. So and that did you was, have to be brutal? Did you? I did, I did. I did. It was horrible. It was the, it was the worst thing I've ever had to do. Was, was to say farewell to Chris because I love Chris was a lovely lovely person did, did and you lose you lost uh, Fritz, you lost Fritz McIntyre at that time as well did you, no, 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 no 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 Fritz, nope. Fritz didn't go until after the life album he was he was right. pissed off with me because I wasn't giving him any of the the co-songwriting uh, parts it was not not dissimilar to Lamont Dozier actually because Fritz, Fritz was a great riff guy 
Um, he, he, and I would give him pieces of the song because he came up with a great riff. So they weren't technically the melody or the lyrics. He didn't do any of those. Um, but he, I just did it partly politically, actually, to keep them happy. Um, that's the way it was, you know. But, for example, the, the title track of our first album, Picture Book, I gave Fritz a songwriting credit on that because he started that riff. I don't know if you're familiar with the song, yeah. but there's a riff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he also did the riff on Thrill Me, which is on the Stars album. And he and, sang on Wonderland, right. didn't he? He sang part lead on Wonderland. Well, yeah, but there were my lyrics and I told him what right. to do. So, right, right. You know, it's, that it's, was an interesting choice, though. Yeah, I just thought it added a, it was like a good diversion and uh, it worked really well. He was a fabulous musician, but again, he wouldn't explore the technology. He he was like a pianist, he was a piano player, and he had to have a he had to have a keyboard tech to take care of all the sounds and stuff. He wasn't doing that himself. And I thought at the time, guys, come on raise your game get get into mm -hmm. stuff you know start expanding your horizons you've got to keep going you can't sit back on your laurels you've got to fucking push you know and i still feel like that you've got to you've got to keep moving you can't mm -hmm. just sit back and go i've done it now i don't want to live like that i want to kind of keep having a good time yeah well, let's just finish on the last on the last album um is it because I listen, I'm a happily married man, children, dad, you know, it's is it harder to write songs about yourself when you're happy? Well, th these songs are not are not about a lot of them are not about myself. Um, actually, I don't want to be disagreeable, but they're not. No. A, a couple of them are actually stories. Uh, one of them, it wouldn't be me, is about a girl that's been trafficked and uh, is ashamed of her past and won't commit to this guy that's crazy about her. And all his friends keep saying, leave her alone, she's bad news, and, and he won't give up on her. So it, it's not always about personal stuff, but what, ah. m one or two of the songs are. Um, but look, Gary, we just do our best, don't we? We do. I, I, I'm just like writing songs, because that's what I do. And I just hope that they're successful. I can't do any more than that. I'm still ambitious. I still love to write songs, and I'm still doing the best I can. Yeah, you got, and you certainly you got it's a proper old tour you got lined up this summer, isn't it? That's um, a, those are fabulous European. I think we're playing one of those, Guy. I think I recognise yeah. a couple of those because uh, Guy and I play with Nick Mason. We were on the road doing that Source Full of Secret show, and um, and and I see you're doing some outside out, outdoors in Italy. Uh, Terms well, I, I hope we cross paths. Um, That'd be great. I, I really like Nick Mason. I always have lovely conversations with him wherever we cross paths. He's a very affable chap, isn't he? Very. He's very affable. Affable is very much the word. Yeah, yeah. We, well, give him my best, will you? We will do. Good, good luck with this album, Mick. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Lovely talking to you guys. Very much. Really, yeah, really enjoyed it, Mick. Really I great. just love. I so just much. love that, you know, you get someone on of a similar age and... It's extraordinary how similar, even though you lived hundreds of miles away from me, how similar our, our musical stepping stones have been. Mm -mm. Oh, well, we've followed similar paths, haven't we? Especially as, yeah. as two songwriters, you know, yeah. within two songwriters within a band. Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck with the tour. Good luck with the album. Thanks, and thank mate. you so much for coming on. Thanks so much, man. Really, I hope we bump into yeah. you. All the very, very best. Thank you, guy. Lovely talking to you. You take Cheers, care. Yeah. All the best. Bye. That was uh, that was really great, wasn't it? You Gary? know what? Uh, my favourite parts are all how us chaps begin, isn't it? Really, it's all it's yeah. all that seventies stuff of uh, youth culture and enthusiasm and tribalism and and he, you know he's he's got all of that information there. I was actually researching Mick. I was quite surprised to find all of that world at the beginning. I was quite surprised to find um, uh, frantic elevators. To be honest. Uh, I wasn't. Well, what the, the only question we didn't ask, which I did want to ask, which is, is that the frantic elevators were actually going for seven years, which when at that age, that is an eternity. Mm, that's right. You know what I mean? Like, they're plugging away for seven years, man, and then finally getting that song and then bailing. That's right. <laughs> and, and actually, first time take that has ever been mentioned on the Rock on Tours. Yeah. Um, I have a theory about that. You don't think they're going to be the new prog, no, do you? I do have a theory no. about that period. <laughs> 
um, that early 90s period. And I'm glad that Mick brought it up. I might save that theory. We'll bring it out on another intro. S save your theory, yeah. I, I, I often wonder because... I know suede kind of tend to come up now as a sort of this sort of precursor. To, I think suede are kind of viewed, they're like, they are to Britpop what Eddie and the Hot Rods are to punk or Dr. Feelgood. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And if you want to hear more, you can go and listen to, to Bernard uh, on a previous episode, can't you? Talking, talking you about that very band, uh, Suede. Um, anyway, uh, we'll have someone uh, fantastic on next week. And thank you so much to Ben uh, Jones, our producer for Gimme Sugar. And uh, thank you so much for you guys for listening. We really appreciate all your comments that you leave on social media. It's so important to us, isn't it, Guy? It's so important, Gary. <laughs> is that the sort of response you wanted? <laughs> right, it is. So, um, <laughs> yes. and, no, it is. It so until then, it's good night from me. And it's good night from them. Rock on Tours is produced by Gimme Sugar Productions, a Warner Music Group UK.